Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Angela Haas. I'm an associate professor of history at Missouri Western State University. And today I'm going to be talking about the witch trials. So generally, when people think of witches, um, maybe setting aside some of the more recent stereotypes of, of witches that we see in, in books like Harry Potter, um, usually people think of an old woman or perhaps a group of old women sitting around a bubbling cauldron full of weird ingredients like toads and human fingers and magical herbs. What are these women doing? They're generally concocting magic potions, seeing into the future, and casting spells on the innocent. Um, the stereotype is really not a new one. It dates back hundreds of years. So these images that I've put up here are some depictions um, of different aspects of the witch stereotype as it arose around 1500 in Europe. Um, in the top left, you can see a witch um, who has made a pact with the devil. So it was commonly believed that witches um, started being witches at the time that they made some kind of pact with a demon who appeared to them and promised them something. Um, in the top right, we can see witches doing evil acts. So in this case, they're actually brewing a storm. It was believed that witches could affect the weather and thus um, bring about bad harvests, which was um, very devastating to communities during this period. Um, and we also see in many of these images, especially top left and bottom, uh, or sorry, top right and bottom left, um, what's called the witch's Sabbath. So this is a meeting of witches um, at night, they would get together and do all of their evil deeds uh, as a group. And this was a really important part of the stereotype because um, since they all were believed to get together, it was also assumed that any accused witch knew other witches and thus um, could be forced to denounce other people also as witches. Now in the bottom right, we also see another aspect of the witch stereotype. Um, it was believed that they could fly. In this case, they're on a broomstick, but in a lot of cases, they're actually flying on um, demons or um, black colored animals and those kinds of things. So most historians have dated the emergence of this stereotype to around 1500, um, but over the past half a millennium or so, all kinds of assumptions have arisen about witch trials, and some of them are more accurate than others. So in this presentation, I want to discuss some of these assumptions, um, explaining the origins of witch trials, and clearing up some misconceptions. So just a few important points of clarification before I get into why the witch trials happened. Um, first of all, a lot of people actually associate witch trials um, with the Middle Ages. Um, so the Middle Ages is usually dated from about 1500 to 50, or uh, about 500 to 1500. Um, certainly during this period, there were people who were put on trial for sorcery or practicing dark magic, um, but rarely did these trials actually lead to the kinds of um, widespread witch hunts that we see in the centuries that followed. So my most widespread witch hunting actually occurred between the year 1500 and 1650. Now this actually overlaps with the Renaissance, um, the Protestant Reformation, and also the early part of the scientific revolution. So to give you a little bit of a sense of, you know, the context in which these are happening, at the same time that um, the witch trials were happening, Isaac Newton was in college, actually in the early stages of developing um, calculus. So it's not usually the period that people associate with witch trials, um, and it happens a bit later than most people um, assume. Now, another misconception about witch trials is that they happened because people during this period were just irrational or even hysterical. Now, certainly from a modern perspective, we might say that, um, you know, a belief in witches is irrational, um, but it's important to, to stress that the existence of witches was very much compatible with these people's conceptions of how the universe worked. Nearly everyone, without exception, believed in the supernatural. So that includes the clergy, that includes lawmakers, that includes kings and queens and also common peasant folk who were, you know, working on farms and were uneducated. 
Furthermore, these trials, which nearly always ended in a guilty verdict, often drew on large amounts of evidence. So they weren't the kind of swift mob violence that most people might assume. Legal experts could actually take up to a year to collect evidence in order to put somebody on trial for witchcraft. Now, another kind of common misconception about the witch trials is that they essentially were rooted in misogyny um, and the hatred of women and that um, witch hunting amounted to women hunting. Now, it is true that between 70 and 80 percent of all people who were condemned for witchcraft during this period were women. However, that also means that between 20 percent and 30 percent were men. So it's certainly quite imaginable for people during this period um, that men could be witches, right? Even if many believed that men were less likely to have the kind of qualities that would make them really susceptible to the devil and thus witchcraft. Um, historians have examined witch trials in many different regions of Europe, you know, France, Spain, England, Sweden, and it goes on and on. Um, and in all of these regions, there were men also put on trial for witchcraft. In some places, although these are relatively rare, um, men were actually more likely to be accused of witchcraft and condemned for witchcraft than women were. So the last kind of misconception that I want to talk about is this idea that during this period, there existed some kind of actual pagan cult or surviving pre-Christian pagan religion, um, of which most adherents were women, and that the witch trials were really the result of Christian authorities persecuting members of this cult. Some have attributed the roots of um, modern Wicca, for example, to this pre-modern religion, um, but it's important to note that Wicca came about only in the 20th century, and there is no historical evidence whatsoever that any kind of pagan witch cult ever existed in the early modern period. So this fact makes explaining the witch trials really difficult. Um, between the years 1500 and 1650, an estimated 45,000 to 60,000 people were put to death for the crime of witchcraft. Um, these people were accused of doing things like making pacts with devils, of um, flying on de demon animals, um, of uh, turning people into goats, and a wide variety of other things that we can assume they really didn't do, right? Um, so if there was no actual witch cult, and logic tells us that they couldn't have actually committed the crimes that they were accused of, then how is it that all these people could be put to death for this crime? Um, so what I would like to do here is address two major issues surrounding the witch trials. First, why is it that these trials happened when they did? Um, and why is it that they could come about if there were no witches? Um, and the second part is, why is it that women were considerably more likely than men to be accused of and condemned for witchcraft? So first, I'm going to start out with why the witch trials happened. Um, you know, the, there's no single explanation for why the trials happened or why they happened when they did. So modern historians have spent many decades in search of an explanation for the witch trials, and they've discovered that there was a multitude of contributing factors. Um, the causes that I'm going to lay out are not the only explanatory factors, but I'm going to really hit on some of the big ones. So first, it's important to keep in mind that, of course, there was a universal belief in magic. Um, almost everybody, without exception, believed um, that both God and the devil interacted with humans, that they regularly intervened in people's daily lives, um, and that there were uh, supernatural powers that humans could actually tap into and try to control. So, this explains kind of why generally people believe that magic existed um, because they, they lived in this very um, supernatural universe, right? They believed that the supernatural was just an extension of the natural. Um, trying to explain why people which believed in witches in particular is a bit more complicated. Um, so first of all, 
there is some amount of biblical precedent. Um, and this is a deeply Christian society um, all across Europe. Um, so there is some biblical precedent for witchcraft existing and dark magic existing. For example, um, the famous line, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live in Exodus. Um, however, despite there being this kind of vague biblical precedent, um, the kind of stereotype that I laid out at the beginning of this presentation has no biblical precedent whatsoever. So historians generally agree that this witch stereotype had a wide variety of roots. Some of it was biblical. Um, some aspects of this stereotype uh, came from tales that were told throughout the Middle Ages, um, kind of Christian tales, even about saints that were told throughout the Middle Ages. And some aspects of this stereotype also came from folklore. So for example, the idea that witches could fly at night and that they met um, together in some kind of um, witches Sabbath, this gathering of witches. Now, how did this stereotype ultimately get worked into people's mentalities to the point where the majority of people in Europe believed in witches? Um, a lot of this comes from cultural media of the time. So, for example, um, there were treatises written by theologians, the most famous of these um, you can see in the bottom right screen, that is the Malleus Maleficarum that was written by Heinrich Kramer. And we'll actually return to a, that uh, in a little bit. Um, there were also a lot of handbooks that were created um, for inquisitors who would put witches on trial. And these handbooks would tell them what a witch looked like and what a witch would act like and the kinds of things that witches were thought to do. And as they printed more and more of these, the witch trials got more uniform because inquisitors knew exactly what they were looking for. Now, other ways that the witch stereotype spread is through, for example, um, the preaching of the clergy. So priests and Protestant pastors alike um, both believed that witches were a very real threat um, and they preached about that threat to their congregations. Um, there were also many plays that were that represented witches and all of their evil deeds. Um, here, the most famous one is probably Shakespeare's Macbeth, right, which has the, the three witches um, who can see into the future and um, interact with Macbeth and have this kind of bubbling cauldron. But there were many other plays that had these kinds of stereotypes of witches worked into them. There's another one here in the, the top right of the screen called The Witch of Edmonton. Many of these plays claim to actually be true stories. So this is another way that people are getting this idea <clears throat> kind of worked into their head, right? Um, and finally, there are um, many images that are circ circulating during this period, such as the one that I have at the bottom of the screen here, which portrays um, you know, women gathering and, br and brewing storms during their uh, meetings of their witches' coven. Overall, the printing press went a long ways in helping to solidify this um, stereotype of the witch and implant it into people's minds across Europe. Now, Europeans had always um, really, you know, for millennia, believed in the possibility of dark magic. So for most people, this kind of stereotypical witch was really compatible with beliefs that they already held, um, and it really didn't seem to them to be a huge stretch. Right. So the other issue is why did witch trials reach their height during this period in particular? Um, and one overarching explanation for this comes from religious conflict. So this is the age of the Protestant Reformation, um, when you see a division um, between Protestants and Catholics arising. And this led to a lot of political conflict, including warfare. So this is the, the same era of the witch trials is also known as the era of the wars of religion. Um, people are very um, anxious about um, the, fate, the fate of Christianity, and many believed that uh, demonic activity was really like super abounding, that it was just everywhere. Now, unsurprisingly, perhaps uh, Protestants tended to blame Catholics for this, and Catholics blamed Protestants likewise um, for the increase in demonic activity in Europe. Um, but what's important to keep in mind is that um, whether Protestant or Catholic, generally people believe that there were more demons um, in Europe than ever before and because of this religious conflict. And 
with all these demons hanging around, it was inevitable that people were likely to um, interact with those demons and potentially fall prey to their machinations um, and make pacts with them. So for the sake of time, I'm really simplifying here, but it's just important to keep in mind that um, context was everything, right? Um, and many people during this period believed that, you know, the, the end of the world was coming. It was a very anxious time um, for, for uh, the Christians of early modern Europe. Now, on a local level, there are certain events that are more likely to make witch trials happen. Um, for example, um, poor harvest, so bad weather, um, warfare, and uh, the spread of disease, and even political upheaval. So when there were misfortunes that hit a region, this made people more likely to go seeking answers for the, those misfortunes, especially if there was more than one misfortune that kind of got piled on top. So you have a war, and then disease also hits, and people start questioning whether this could be witchcraft, because they're being told, of course, that witches are a very real threat. Um, so regional conflict was really important. Um, political upheaval, as we'll see, um, anywhere where legal authority started to break down and the court systems started, the authority of, um, you know, the court system started getting shaky and a lot of legal authority was placed into the hands of locals. This made it considerably more likely that witch trials would get out of hand. So on a regional level, there are certain things that made it more likely for witch trials to happen. But of course, most um, witch trials began very locally and um, they began from a very personal place. Generally, um, uh, it was a certain individual who was seen as being suspicious or something like that. And so the accusations came from locals in most cases. There were um, some circumstances under which you might see a local noble lord um, or a local religious leader who becomes kind of obsessed with the idea of witches and begins to, to um, actually go out and hunt for them. But in most cases, um, the accusation um, came from within a community. So any type of misfortune could lead to an accusation of witchcraft especially if there was a local person who seemed to have some kind of special relationship with the supernatural or who was marginalized in the community. So a death, a sudden death of a person or livestock, um, a hailstorm that destroyed, destroyed crops, any of these types of events could lead to a community members searching for a cause um, and being suspicious that it might be witchcraft. Um, those who fell victim to witch trials were often just the victims of very poor timing. So, for example, um, a local villager had gone to somebody's house looking for herbs to cure one of their sheep, and this local person gave them the herbs, um, which they then fed to their sheep, but their sheep continued to get sick, and then they all died. Um, and then they turned on the person whose help they were initially seeking and blamed them. <clears throat> and they, you know, maybe had the kind of personality qualities that people associated with witches. Maybe it was an older woman who was prone to fighting with neighbors and these kinds of things. So sometimes, you know, it could just be timing. Um, somebody uh, who is, has a kind of bad reputation goes to someone's home and two days later their son dies and they suspect that person of witchcraft. So, I think and I hope, I guess, um, that this gives us some sense of, of why the trials happened, um, why people got accused. So now I want to turn a little bit to the other issue, um, which is why women? Why is it that women were such a substantial portion of those who were accused of witchcraft and condemned for witchcraft? Um, now, certainly there are certain kinds of cultural assumptions about the nature of women that contributed to suspicions that they were more likely to fall prey to the influence of demons um, than men were. So um, there were many treatises during this period. I mentioned the Malleus Maleficarum earlier. This is probably the most famous of these treatises. Um, it was reprinted several times throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, and it was used as a kind of handbook for people who are trying to spot a witch and know what witches did and who is most likely to be a witch. 
Um, and in this book, the author Heinrich Kramer claimed that um, witches were more likely to be uh, women than men because women were um, intellectually inferior, they were gullible, so they're more likely to be misled by the devil. He also um, claimed that women were more wrathful, so they're more likely to seek retribution if somebody harmed them um, or did them wrong in some way. And he even went so far as to say that women were generally just defective um, because the first woman, Eve, was made from a bent rib. And so, you know, women had always been more likely to um, be inclined towards the, the, the devil than, than men were. Now, um, we can also see some of these, uh, these kinds of ideas coming up in a lot of other um, cultural productions of the time from plays to, you know, theological works to images like the one here in the bottom right screen. Um, where we see a woman being misled by a demon and she's abusing this poor man um, because this demon has convinced her to take this kind of uh, power that he's willing to give her. Um, so this has a lot of the elements of the witch stereotype, right? She's um, being influenced by the devil and taking on um, power that women really, it was believed they shouldn't have. So now these kinds of cultural beliefs um, did not directly translate to witch trials. Um, and it's not as though all women were considered to be evil. Um, so, you know, how do we get from suspicions that women are more likely to be um, witches or more inclined towards witchcraft to actually putting women on trial and executing them for this crime? Um, you know, accusations, as I mentioned, tend to be very personal and localized. So you need some kind of spark, right? A first accusation. And here, women's roles and communities become very important. Um, women were generally um, associated with fertility. Um, it was only women who would have been at childbirths. Um, and many of the kinds of things that witches were thought to do, for example, um, harm crops or make people, make men impotent or any variety of things like that, it was all considered to be within the female domain, right? Childbirth and death and caring for the sick. Um, and so these suspicion was more likely to fall upon women in part because these are the roles that they fulfilled in communities. Um, you know, being midwives and healers and caretakers and these kinds of things. Um, usually also it was um, marginalized members of the community who were more likely to be accused of witchcraft. Um, and this includes particularly widows. So in this case, even the fact that women actually had longer lifespans on average than men contributed to them being more likely to be accused of witchcraft. Um, so women, for um, example, um, it was kind of assumed that once they were past their child rearing years, um, oftentimes they became bitter because maybe they didn't have as prominent of a role in the community as they once did. Um, there were all kinds of deeply um, negative cultural assumptions about postmenopausal women. Um, and there was a sense that you know, because they had a harder time supporting themselves later in life, they were bitter, and this made them more likely to lash out at the community. Now, there are also um, kind of practical issues that go along with this that have to do largely with the nature of the witch trials themselves. So there are legal issues that also made women more likely to be accused of witchcraft um, than men or um, I should say condemned for witchcraft, right? By the time that they got put on trial, they were also more vulnerable. So I wanna talk a little bit um, at the end here about what witch trials were like. So, um, you know, first, witches, um, when they were placed on trial were usually already assumed to be guilty um, if they actually got to this, this stage. Um, and inquisitors tended to use very leading questions. Um, so for example, if they asked a witch, uh, an accused witch, um, you know, whether she had seen, um, you know, when she saw a demon, they wouldn't say, did you see a demon? They would say, when did you see this demon? Um, and despite how much they might protest and insist that they were innocent, 
the inquisitors would continue to push them. So if you read the, the trial records from witch trials, it makes it very clear that they were trying to, to almost trick these people into admitting that they were witches. And of course, it's because they went into these trials, the inquisitors went into these trials, generally assuming that this person was already guilty. Um, once you got into a trial, it was very difficult to get out. Um, and part of the reason for this was because of torture. Now, torture generally functioned as follows. So the um, judge or inquisitor would start by um, showing them torture instruments. Um, if the initial questioning did not get them the answers that they wanted, they would basically threaten them with torture. And then if they still refused to confess, then they would torture them. And then they would give them the opportunity to recant, and then they would torture them again. Now, this wasn't entirely unusual. So um, uh, in the early modern period, it was common to use torture in trials. However, usually you could only torture somebody, for example, who was placed on trial for murder once. Um, witchcraft was considered to be an exceptional crime um, and extremely heinous. So you could actually torture people a second time and use um, worse torture techniques than you would during normal trials. Now, generally, everybody placed on trial for witchcraft confessed, right? This is one of those um, things where, you know, sometimes people have looked back and said, well, why are they confessing? Why are they saying they're witches if they weren't actually doing these things? And torture is the largest reason why that was happening. Um, because everybody um, would get would reach a kind of breaking point during these trials where they would just start confessing. And because they had been bombarded constantly with questions, they knew what the Inquisitor wanted to hear. Now, just to return a little bit to the issue of women, when women were on trial, generally women were more legally vulnerable than men. Um, if they were accused, it was more difficult, particularly for women who were widows or unmarried, um, to provide a defense for themselves. So in most parts of Europe, women did not have um, their own legal status, independent legal status, so they needed a man to stand for them at trial. Um, and if they didn't have, say, a father or a brother or a son who is willing to do that, um, they were in a very difficult legal position. So this is part of the reason why widows and unmarried women are considerably more likely um, to be condemned for witchcraft, um, if accused, than married women were. Okay, so, um, you know, I just want to conclude a little bit about um, the witch trials themselves. Uh, it is important to keep in mind um, that, uh, you know, accusations of witchcraft were not necessarily excuses to get rid of troublesome neighbors, right? People were very anxious about things like infertility and bad harvests. I mean, people were just living on the margins of uh, survival. They were just barely getting by. Um, and they also deeply believed in that dark magic was real. And they were told by both government and religious authorities that they were real. Um, so, you know, this was not, I should say, an irrational belief within the context of the time, right, um, to believe that it may actually be witches who were um, doing these bad things to your community. Um, you know, it is, so it's the reason why witch trials were so widespread and so devastating is because it worked at multiple levels of society. So. Um, it's not just villagers who are trying to explain why their cow died, and it's not just church officials concerned about religious deviance, um, and it's not just government officials worried about witches undermining their authority, or men worried about women undermining their authority. Um, it's really because people of all walks of life deeply believed that magic was very real, um, and thus were anxious about the powers of those who could apparently work dark magic. Now, after 1650, witch trials in Europe declined dramatically, um, almost immediately. Um, so by the time that the Salem witch trials uh, happened, for example, in the 1680s, the European witch trials have largely died out. There are almost no more witch trials. Um, and this isn't because people suddenly stopped believing in witches. Um, in fact, people continued, many people continued to believe 
um, in witchcraft considerably later than this period, um, the really crucial element here is legal reform, right? So the witch trials were a massive breach of justice um, and a, um, the result of a really problematic legal system. And many began to question, especially people who were involved in these trials, began to question whether you could ever prove that somebody was a witch or not. Not that witches didn't exist, but that the way they were trying to um, get people to confess to being witches could also get people who were not witches to confess, right? So once um, legal authorities, and in many cases, this would actually be like royal authorities, like kings and queens, would start to um, uh, have more oversight over local trials, that's when you see them decline. So for example, in France in the 1620s, the king decided all witch trials had to go through the high court in Paris. And after that, you see a dramatic decline in the number of people who are being denounced for, or not really denounced for witchcraft, but condemned for witchcraft, right? People are still making the accusations, but they're not going through the legal system um, anymore. And in many cases, they're just being thrown out of court. So it was really legal reform that became absolutely crucial and also the elimination of torture um, during these trials. So I hope that that gives you um, some sense of, of what caused the witch trials during this period and why women um, were more likely to be accused of witchcraft and condemned for witchcraft than men. Um, this is a very complicated topic and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. So if you want to, um, Go ahead and send, uh, you know, type questions into the, the comment section. I will do my best to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for listening.